there are four controlling dimensions that allow us to determine the type of information we can actually extract from an image taken from an aircraft or satellite. So we speak of spatial, spectral, radiometric and temporal dimensions. When we're interested in the spatial dimension, we're considering the size of objects and features that we can that, that, that we can determine. If we're interested in the colour of features, we're considering the, the spectral dimension. If we want to know about the contrast between objects and features, this is the radiometric dimension. And if we're interested in information related to the time of day, year, cycle, etc., this is the temporal dimension. Okay, so spatial is space, spectral is colour, radiometric is contrast, and temporal is time. A bit more information about spatial dimensions. So this really controls the size of features you can identify and the extent of the area that's been imaged. Okay, we talk about terms like the instantaneous field of view, the field of view, the ground resolution element, and the, pic and the pixel or pic picture element. So the main terms really are the pixel size, which relates to the ground resolution element. So the pixel size is, is that in an image, and the ground resolution element is that area on the ground which the pixel relates to. The swath width is the width of the image. So this gives us an idea about the extent that an image covers. And if we're talking about the measurement of spatial resolution, we're really considering the size of individual objects that we're able to detect and identify. But usually people just refer to the pixel size as being the spatial resolution. Now there's always a trade-off between the scene extent, or the swath width, and the, the amount of detail or pixel size that we can see. So for example, we've got the Landsat image here which covers a large area in this, in this particular case. This is the northern tip of New Zealand. Um, so this is the Landsat scene which covers a large area, but if we have a look at the amount of detail, we don't have a lot there. You can see the individual pixels at 28.5 metres. Now the next idea is spot. So this is a 60 by 60 metre scene here. So it covers a reasonable size area and we have a 10 meter pixel size so we're starting to get a little bit more detail there. If we then go down to Quick Bird, this white box here, um, we're covering a much smaller area um, but we're getting considerably more detail. So we're starting to pick out individual buildings, roads, um, vegetation types etc. And we can then go a step down further from Quick Bird to pan sharpen the image. So this is a combination of using the panchromatic band which is a roughly half a metre, and the multispectral bands, which are 2.4 metres. And so again, we just get that additional detail. And that's really what you see in Google Earth, is pan-sharpened imagery. So we lose a bit of information on the spectral side of things, but we get a lot more on spatial. So the way an imaging sensor works is that usually if it can cover a large area, then it will do so with large pixel size. And the, the way it looks at an area is, well, from, from the sensor's point of view, is the, the term the instantaneous field of view. So that's the area from which the reflected or emitted light is measured. Spectral dimensions, on the other hand, are really referring to the portions of the electromagnetic spectrum that a sensor is measuring within. So if we have a look at the graph here, the blue line shows atmospheric transmittance and the green line shows where Landsat thematic map of bands were placed. Okay, so bands 1 through 5 and 7. Okay, so what you can tell here is that they've really been placed in areas where there's maximum atmospheric transmittance. So there's not a lot of point in placing a spectral band where not much light gets through the atmosphere because, for example, of water absorption. So you can see the sensitivities here, they're relatively broad um, and you can count that there's six bands there and the, there's even broader sensitivity in the mid-infrared band. We can also have a look at Iconos for example and how this relates to a bird vision system. So the birds, birds are able to see in the UV, so we see that on the left hand side here, but then they have blue, green and red sensitivities as well. And that's the same sort of thing as what Iconos does. does. It has the blue, green, red and a near infrared sensitivity. And then it also has this panchromatic band which is sensitive 
across the region of the spectrum. And by being sensitive across a much larger region of the electromagnetic spectrum, this allows it to be able to decrease the pixel size that it can be looking at. So spectral band location determines the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation that's being measured. So panchromatic sensors usually record broad, a broad part of the spectrum, whereas multispectral sensors will record, say, maybe about 10 predetermined bands. Hyperspectral sensors, on the, on the other hand, will record really narrow bands, but a lot of them. So, for example, if we look at multispectral compared to hyperspectral, we've got a vegetation spectral signature in the background. And if we consider Landsat, it's got measurements in the blue, green, red, near infrared, and mid infrared bands. And if you have a look, it's actually only making one measurement in each of those areas. Okay, so if you consider a graph made from Landsat, it would be a relatively um, sharp and averaged graph there. A hyperspectral sensor, on the other hand, would create that graph with a large number of individual bands. And so that's the difference between hyperspectral and multispectral, the number of bands and the width of those individual bands. Radiometric dimensions really control the amount of contrast that you can see in an individual image. So for example, if we look at this top right image, we've got a black and white image. Okay, this is one bit or two levels. Okay, so the way the way it works in terms of talking about bits is that everything is two to the power of that particular value. So two to the power of one is two, which means it's two levels, and two to the power of one is one bit. So two to the power of two would be two bit, and two to the power of two equals four levels. Two to the power of eight is eight bit, to the power of 8 equals 256. Okay, so again, if we have a look at this top right image, we've got two levels and it's black and white. Everything is either black or it's white, and there's no distinction between anything within those those levels. If we get, go to a four level image or a two bit, we start to see a couple of shades of grey. So we'll have black, white, and two shades of grey in between. The more levels we have, the more shades of grey that we have to look at as well. And this really determines the sensor's ability to separate features based on the amount of electromagnetic radiation that they're reflecting and absorbing. Landsat, for example, is 8-bit, so it has 256 brightness levels, or values between 0 and 255. So that means you can have black, white, and 254 levels of grey in between there. Temporal dimensions are really referring to anything to do with, uh, with time. So that's, they're platform dependent and they're talking about how frequently an imaging sensor can be used to obtain an image over a target area. Okay, this also considers the revisit time, so how frequently that orbit for a satellite is going over the same place. We're also interested in the acquisition time of year, so this might have have an effect on vegetation phenology, any seasonal differences, sun angle, cloud cover, tidal differences. So this, this value in terms of temporal resolution is often fixed for Earth observation satellites. However, as, as more satellites go up, they're generally starting to have what we call pointable optics. So it means they're not looking directly down all the time, but they have the ability to point to the sides. And this increases their overpass capacity. So the time of day of image acquisition affects solar elevation at azimuth, which will in turn affect the amount of atmospheric interaction we have. It will affect shadow, hot, spot, hot spots or glint on the water, and cloud cover and fog. It's also important to consider in tidal environments how the time of image acquisition affects that. We also look at the repeat cycle of satellites. Now, if you have a look at the website listed here, this will allow you to download a small application which will show you a large number of satellites that you can use 
to determine when a satellite is passing over a location at any particular time. And this is really handy if you want to go out in the field day, in, in the field on the same day of a satellite overpass, for example. And it's, I guess, it's important to note here also that the majority of satellites pass over around about 10 o'clock in the morning, and this is because of statistically lower cloud at this particular time of day. So there, there are a couple of satellites which have afternoon overpasses, but the majority are morning overpass satellites.